This is Boombreak Daybreak. Middle East and Africa are top stories this morning. U.S. and European futures rise while oil trades lower this morning amid hopes that tensions in the Middle East remain contained. This all after the U.S. and allies helped to mostly foil the first strike on Israel from Iranian soil. Focus now shifting to the possibility of retaliation. The United Nations chief calling for calm at an emergency Security Council meeting, saying it's time to step back from the brink. Region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. It's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai, and let's take a look at how markets have started to trade across Asia and into the future session. So as you can see, we are seeing green on the screen. It seems that the market is breathing a sigh of relief that perhaps the Saturday night, Sunday morning attack on Israel might not get escalated, depending, of course, on Israel's response. But we're seeing S&P futures and Eurostoxx 50 futures higher. Now, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index, it's a little different there. We're down nine-tenths of a percent. We're seeing a sell-off in equity equities in Japan and Korea in particular, the Nikkei 225 down 1%. Dollar yen at 153.69, we need to note that. But you can see the calm in oil markets. Perhaps the geopolitical risk was already built in. Brent crude down 19 cents. It is just above $90 a barrel and WTI just above $85 a barrel. Gold rising but well off the $2,400 that we saw the week before Eid. I do want to mention how we saw the Sunday session trade in the Middle East because we did have the Tadawal down about three-tenths of a percent, but that was far off the 1.8 percent lower that it opened at. And in Israel, the TA35 was up a quarter of a percent by the end of the session. We did have a couple of markets, though, that saw major sell-offs, including Qatar and Kuwait. So Iran's weekend attack on Israel with more than 300 missiles and drones does mark a perilous turn for a fragile region. The unprecedented attack is the first strike on the Jewish state from Iranian soil. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the country will defend itself against Iran and continue to work with its allies, including the United States, on an appropriate response. The state of Israel is strong. The IDF is strong. The public is strong. We appreciate the U.S. standing by Israel's side, as well as the support of Great Britain, France, and many other countries. I have set a clear principle. Whoever strikes us, we will strike him. We will defend ourselves against every threat, and we will do this calmly and with determination. Meanwhile, Iran's Joint Chief of Staff, General Mohammad Bagheri, says any further attack from Israel will be met with a greater military response. From our point of view, this operation is over, and there is no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Paul Wallace. So, Paul, lots of hawkish talk. It does seem like the ball is in Israel's court. What is Israel likely to do, factoring in all of the different parts of the cabinet that have to be satisfied? That is, I think, the, the biggest question for global markets um, this week. Israel will have a range of options, and I think the most uh, bearish outcome for, for markets and the one, one that the U.S., uh, uh, the U.S., uh, European countries um, and uh, Arab states who will least want is, is Israel retaliating aggressively uh, to Iran, especially with the strike on Iranian soil. Um, there is a possibility, and I think this is one that uh, many of Israel's allies would quite like, um, for Israel to react very, um, very softly, um, either not at all or in a way that doesn't provoke further um, Iranian uh, reaction. Perhaps it could go after Iran's or continue to go after Iran's proxies in the region, such as Hezbollah, but avoid um, a direct strike on Iranian soil or its embassies um, around the world or any kind of assassination that's, that's too public. The U.S., um, Arab states and European countries obviously want to stop this 
escalating. Essentially, they want what happened on Saturday night with this barrage um, of, of uh, missiles and drones fired against Israel uh, to be the end of it, uh, primarily because it didn't cause that much damage. One thing to note is that both Iran and Israel are cl claiming victory. Israel is saying that it deterred uh, this attack completely and it showed its um, military technological prowess over Iran. Iran saying that it scared um, Israel and the U.S. and so therefore, um, it, in its view, um, this whole issue is over. But we're going to have to wait and see over the next few weeks exactly what Israel does. It could be declared a win-win for everybody under one circumstance, right? What, though, does Israel do about the rest of its problems, including the war in Gaza and its potential invasion of Rafah? Does that still go ahead? Again, another very big question, because obviously Gaza hasn't gone away. The war there continues to rage. Um, over the weekend, Israeli officials haven't said too much about Rafah. But in the run-up uh, to Saturday night's events, they were still very much sticking to their line that an assault, uh, a ground offensive on Rafa had to happen. It was just a question of when, uh, not if. The U.S. is still applying a pressure on Israel to essentially back away from that plan. We'll have to see whether the weekend's events with Iran's attack uh, change anything with regards to Rafa and, and, and Gaza overall. Um, but as far as Israel is saying publicly, the, uh, the offensive on Rafa is still going to happen at some stage. All right, a lot to mull over. And, of course, we will be getting more statements, I'm sure, throughout the day. That's Bloomberg's Paul Wallace. Thank you so much. Oil traders have so far shrugged off Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel with gains held in check by signs the conflict will remain contained. Bloomberg's Anthony DePaola joins us now for more. Anthony, was there already this kind of geopolitical risk built into the oil market? I hadn't thought so. Uh, good morning, Vani. Yeah, well, we, we do see a, a very little reaction in the market at all today, uh, but we did see kind of a run-up on, on Friday, kind of in expectation that something was going to happen. Uh, some traders already taking bets that, that, that there would be some reaction and, and being a little bit nervous. Uh, a, a lot of the analysts that we're hearing from uh, o over the weekend had been saying that there was about a, a 5 to $10 uh, risk premium in prices already, and we did see a run-up uh, to the 90s. Uh, so far this month. So there has been some uh, risk premium put into oil, some discounting for the fact that there would be something happening and some kind of reaction after that, that initial Israeli attack at the start of the month on that uh, uh, Iranian embassy compound in uh, Syria. So there was ex some expectation there. Uh, there's also a lot of fundamental basis for uh, stronger oil in terms of uh, some demand that's higher than expected. Uh, on the flip side of that, we do have a good amount of supply in the market, and that's one of those things that's keeping a lid on prices today, I think, uh, Vani, uh, the fact that there is that uh, additional supply in the market. Until that's really affected, uh, we're not going to see that run up in prices uh, yet, Vani. It's interesting, though, isn't it, Anthony, because with Saturday night, Sunday morning's attack, Iran did take this war out of the shadows. Does that make it more likely that we'll see volatility and the potential for, you know, tit for tats in the future? Maybe not, you know, immediately, but in the future, or less likely because now if it returns this war to the shadows, well, then it's gone away for a while. Yeah, I mean, these are two... Uh, uh instances that are big escalations. When we see Israel and Iran uh, taking direct action against one another, uh, that is moving it beyond that kind of proxy war that we'd seen so far, uh, where Iran was using other groups like uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, um, militias in, in Syria or Iraq. Uh, and, and Israel, and in some cases even the U.S., were, were hitting those groups. So this is that first uh, direct confrontation, which is a big geopolitical escalation. Uh, however, uh, with the Iranians saying they think it's completed, with the uh, Israelis declaring uh, victory, and with the Western uh, countries, yes, backing Israel, but not backing Israel to really retaliate in any significant way, uh, all the parties are seeming to try to put a, draw a line under this and, and, and put a stop to it. And, and again, the real risk there is if we do see something impacting uh, oil flows out of uh, the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz, uh, that's uh, an area that would affect uh, Saudi exports, but would also affect Iranian exports. So there is a, a limited willingness so far to go down that road, 
But if uh, Iran feels that its back is up against the wall, it, it could take that step. And that's what traders are really watching, and that's the sign that, that, that traders are really looking for in the market before uh, they start to that run up in prices and to take those higher bets, Vani. Definitely not seeing that yet anyway, which is good news. Bloomberg's Anthony DePaula, thank you so much. Let's turn now to Brett McGonigal, CEO at Capital Inc., who joins me in the Dubai studio. Brett, what does all of the weekend's activities and you know, into this week, and we're waiting on statements, we're waiting on more statements, what does it mean for volatility in markets, not just equity markets, but beyond? Yeah, look, so listen, I think that you know, both the guests that were on before are talking about things calming down a little bit. So uh, whenever you have these tensions at such high levels, there's a great, you know, le there's some real the challenge is to calm the markets and to calm everybody's positioning right now. I think that uh, Iran's been very clear about that this was a one-time thing and if uh, Israel keeps levels where they are, I think we can reach that calm. Oil certainly telling us that we're there. I mean, oil would be trading much higher if the, if the markets thought that this was going to get further along. I think one of the interesting points to bring in here maybe is that you used uh, the war in the shadows. Bring, Iran bringing this to the head right now maybe is what this conflict needs for everyone to take another look at it and say, what are we doing here? And take a step back and maybe we can have calmer heads prevail in, in even, you know, in Gaza and, and, and Israel. Well, that sort of depends on what happens next in terms of any new kind of invasion of Rafah and how the Arab world reacts to that as well, right? Brett, would you change your positioning here in any way, given that the market has been pretty sanguine about geopolitical risk? You know, many commentators say that. And yet, geopolitical risk is clearly a daily thing. Yeah. So it's here to stay. I think everybody, you know, there's a certain dose of it in everything that everyone's looking at. Um, I would say that continued geopolitical tensions unfortunately revert back to the safety trade. And the safety trade seems to be money into mega cap uh, U.S. names. You see Asia's trading off today, Japan's trading off. Regionally, you probably get some calm. But whenever there's conflict, people look to the safe names. And the safety net seems to continue to be the big cap names in the U.S. I think everyone would like to see that change a little bit and see the, the uh, rally broaden out and go back into Asia and to Europe. I just don't think it's happening right now. Before all of this happened, we had a very strange week in U.S. stocks last week and trading. We got inflation data that was hotter than anticipated. We got, you know, maybe signs that the Fed can't move as early as it would have in other circumstances. And then, of course, we also had some bank earnings that really threw the market off on Friday. How would you respond to all of that this week if we hadn't had everything that's happened in between? <laughs> so let's we'll, we'll make the decision pre-Friday. So all the stuff that's happening pre-Friday, you know, I, you and I were talking before we went on. You know, I think it's actually gotten kind of silly. And I'm using the word silly with the Fed because they're using words like silly. They're using sticky. They're using for longer. These are not institutional words. They're not uh, words that analysts use. I think the Fed has gotten very emotional and the Fed has proven that they're always behind the curve. Sticky inflation is a thing though, right? It's, people talk about it. It's a, you know, economists use Yeah, but let's as... remember where we started. It was transitory for a long period of time. Transitory is a little bit more institutional, I think, than sticky. The, my, my thought is just that it's emotional. We're going into the, we're going to the election. The Fed should be getting what they need to get done now now they shouldn't be pushing it out into september you have the election in november it gets highly politicized at that point i just don't see why they can't see and read some of the tea leaves that this is the time to be acting china's helicopter moneying in there's no way the two biggest economies have conflicting monetary policies. You're saying the Fed should just cut and yeah. get started? Yeah. But the data doesn't back that up. The labor market is extraordinarily strong and it might just feed more inflation. Yeah, so I think you're, I mean, they are data driven to a point, but I think they're slow to react. If you look at what they did prior to raising all the rates, they should have been raising earlier. So I, I just, you know, they're th they're, they have this course of action that's like threading the needle. And I just don't understand what the benefit of that is. They need to cut rates. If you look at the two largest economies, being China and the U.S., they are on diametrically up opposing monetary policies. How long can that happen? How long do they stay in those ways? There's no way that the two largest economies in the world are that different and not codependent. Given how you feel that you think policy is you know, incorrect in the United States right now, what does that make you do with your money? Are you all cash? 
No, I mean, look, it's all in mega cap. I mean, that's where the money hides right now because it's a great proxy. You know, you're, you're getting global growth. You know, they, these, these names are everywhere. Um, they're easy to get in and out of. There's huge liquidity pools. But it, that trade is defensive in nature. So, like I said, I'd love to see the, the, this rally broaden out and have some new names brought to the fold and get more into Asia, spill over into the Middle East, into, into Europe. It's just not happening right now because people are confused and uncertainty breeds this defensive behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing from, from money managers. Brett, thank you so much for joining us in studio today. That is Brett McGonigal, CEO at Capital Link. And still ahead, as tensions with Iran rise, we'll get the view of risk intelligence platform Rain. That's coming up later this hour. This is Bloomberg. Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. The world is now watching for Israel's response to Iran's unprecedented attack. President Biden has reaffirmed America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel in a phone call with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. But his administration has stressed they are not looking for a war with Iran. The Israelis will respond. Uh, that's going to be up to them. We understand that and respect that. But the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. We will continue to help Israel defend itself. Let's get more now on the diplomatic response from Bloomberg's Saudi Arabia Bureau Chief Christine Burke. So, Christine, walk us through the latest developments, comments, statements, and so on. Well, the first thing that I will say is while market reaction has been muted and it does seem that there's a kind of a widespread feeling out there that this conflict uh, may not worsen, uh, we are far away from saying that is the case. This is an unprecedented attack by Iran on Israel. Um, and it is the first time we've seen Iran attack Israel from within its soil. Traditionally, it has attacked from its uh, militant proxy groups, including Hezbollah and Hamas. So this latest escalation just suggests that Iran may be willing to kind of step out of the shadows going forward and confront Israel more directly. Already, we have seen that there's been widespread uh, concern among the international community. The G7 met yesterday. Leaders condemned the attack on Israel. Uh, they also have said that they are looking at the possibility of more sanctions sanctions on Iran, but at the same time, they have advised all parties involved to exercise maximum restraint in order for this to not escalate further. So I think the key question now is where Israel is at in this whole thing and how it's going to respond. Well, certainly the war cabinet met Sunday. What do we know about where Israel stands at the moment? I think the one thing that we can say for sure is that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is feeling the pressure on all sides. So there were statements uh, made by some Israeli officials yesterday encouraging Israel to respond aggressively. There were also some comments by people saying that uh, Iran did indeed actually try to inflict more damage on Israel than it did. Um, and so for sure, we know that Netanyahu is feeling pressure from hardliners within his government. On the flip side of that, though, we know very clearly that President Biden does not want to see an escalation in this conflict. Uh, sources have also told Bloomberg that G7 leaders have agreed to use all of their channels of influence to try to prevent Israel from taking any aggressive action. Uh, so we will certainly be trying to answer the question of, of where Israel is going to take things as it considers the pressure that it's facing from multiple sides. Christine, what is the latest for Israel and Gaza after this? Well, it's hard to say at this particular moment in time. We heard from Israel yesterday that Hamas has rejected the latest ceasefire proposal that was tabled uh, by mediators. Um, Israel did not say for sure what was behind that move, but it did comment saying that Hamas is, quote, continuing to exploit tension with Iran and does not want a humanitarian deal and return of hostages. So as of now, there are questions remaining around the status of any potential ceasefire. And also we're, we're questioning where Israel is at in in terms of moving ahead with a ground uh, invasion or a ground operation in Rafah. So much going on. Christine, thank you so much for joining. That is Bloomberg Saudi Arabia Bureau Chief Christine Burke. Plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg Middle East and Africa.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. Goldman Sachs sees Nigeria's Naira extending gains that have already made it the best performing currency in the world this month. Meanwhile, Bloomberg Economics says data out today should show inflation slowing in March, helped by a stronger Naira. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga in Kigali for more on this. So, Ondiro, walk us through the turnaround of the Naira from depreciation to suddenly appreciation. Vonnie, let's circle back to where it all began. In May of 2023, President Bola Ahmed Tinibu came into power, and with him, a raft of reforms, including liberalization of the FX market and also convergence of both the official and the para rate. These decisions led to a depreciation of the Naira by 71 percent in a period of six months. And in quarter one of 2024, we've seen the central bank step in. In their last two monetary policy committee meetings, they hiked the rate by 600 basis points, but they took it a step further and also cleared FX backlog of $7 billion. And the market has been responding very positively to this development. We are seeing the Naira in the month of March appreciated by 14 percent. And so far in April, it has appreciated by 12 percent, trading at about 1,180 in the official rate. And that's where Goldman Sachs is coming from, saying that um, the Naira is supposed to appreciate to about 1,000 to the dollar and then circle back to about 1,200 by the end of the year. Wow, so high numbers. Andira, what can we expect inflation data out today to tell us? If we just go back to the point that I had made earlier about a strong currency, because the Naira is gaining momentum by the day, inflation, annual inflation, is expected to rise a bit slowly, 32.7 percent in March from 31.7 percent in February. And inflation in quarter one is expected to peak at about 35 percent before it begins a gradual descent and close the year at 30 percent. In terms of the central bank, we're likely to see two more interest rate hikes um, closing um, mid-year at about 20 28% from the current 24.75. Depending on where the currency is and how inflation patterns are, then the central bank might choose to hold before they begin their gradual descent. Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga in Kigali. Thank you so much for that update. Let's have a look at how Middle East markets traded in the Sunday session. Of course, trading hasn't started in the Monday session yet, but we did get a bit of a reaction to Sunday nights, um, Sunday early morning, Saturday nights events. And also, of course, we're coming off the Eid holiday week. The Tadawal was down three tenths of a percent by the end of the session, although it did open 1.8 percent lower. In Israel, we saw the TA35 up about a quarter of a percent. The broader market was up even more than that, but we're still talking fractions here, and there was a lot of volatility in the session. Qatar, Kuwait, they were both markets that saw big drops after the Eid holiday and after Saturday night's events. And then in Egypt, we saw a nice gain. We'll be speaking about Egypt in just a few moments, up one and a quarter percent for the benchmark there. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. U.S. and European futures rise while oil trades lower this morning amid hopes that tensions in the Middle East remain contained. This after the United States and allies helped to mostly foil the first strike on Israel from Iranian soil. Focus now shifting to the possibility of Israeli retaliation. The UN chief calling for calm at an emergency Security Council meeting, saying it's time to step back from the brink. It's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Vani Quinn in Dubai. And some of the analyst notes that I've been receiving this morning, escalation unlikely, sigh of relief. This is the tone in markets, and you can see it as they are trading. U.S. and European futures both pointed higher, as you can see, both Nasdaq 100, Dow, and S&P 500 futures. This, of course, after a very down day on Friday as well, it must be said. But the events of the weekend are definitely getting priced into some markets, just perhaps maybe not as much geopolitical risk as we would have thought now that Iran has come out and and done its thing. It says it's one and done. Let's move on because we have other markets to look at. We are seeing a down day across Asia with the Nikkei 225 lower. It was down almost 2% at one point. We have the Hang Seng lower. We also had the MXAP broadly lower. But a different story in China, I should point out. China is trading higher on a regulatory crackdown that seems to be 
putting some enthusiasm into investors into that market. Look at the yen trading very close to 154 at this point. It's just getting weaker and weaker and weaker as we enter earnings season as well, it should be noted. So a stronger dollar versus the yen by four tenths of a percent. And then let's look at the commodity markets because this is where we were focused after those missiles and drones were sent very late Saturday night into the early hours of Sunday morning. Already, we have oil markets pricing out the risk of escalation. Brent trading at $90.24, New York crude $85.37. Gold up slightly, but it had backed off its record anyway, so that's one to watch. But it is worth bearing in mind that unless there's some kind of an escalation that involves probably the Strait of Hormuz, as we heard earlier from Anthony de Paula, then the oil market might be okay for now. We're back to that unprecedented attack on Israel by Iran. Our next guest says the first thing to be watching for is Israel's retaliation, which could take place as soon as today. Let's bring him in now. Ryan Bowl joins us. He's senior Middle East and North Africa analyst at Rain. So, Ryan, all signs point to this de-escalating. The market is saying it. Multinational groups are saying it. Supranational groups are calling on Israel in particular at this point not to retaliate. After all, the Iran attack was a retaliation in itself. What does Israel decide to do? Well, Israel has to respond to this attack directly on its soil. How it decides to attack is very much up in the air. Uh, certainly, we have passed the moment of unplanned escalation. Israel is now deliberately planning its retaliatory strike in a way that is supposed to escalate to de-escalate. Essentially, what Israel needs to figure out is how to get back to deterrence with the Iranians, where the Iranians don't feel like a door has been opened for them to regularly strike Israel's own territory from their own. Ryan, why does Israel have to respond? Why does it have to retaliate? It was an attack on its soil, but it in itself was a retaliation, and it's heard from the Iranians that it's one and done. Well, if they don't respond to the Iranians, then there is that precedent that's set from Tehran's perspective, as well as some other regional rivals, that countries like Iran can attack Israeli soil without any sort of military response. That would embolden them in future escalation scenarios and would complicate things. For example, if, if Israel ever does invade southern Lebanon to try to clear out Hezbollah from, from those areas, uh, that could create a scenario in which Iran feels emboldened to strike Israel earlier or more often, uh, or it could end up in a scenario in which any time Iran wants to signal its displeasure to Israel would have forced them to change policies, they could also resume these similar kind of attacks. And Israel simply doesn't want to live in a world in which Iran feels like it can strike uh, Israel more or less on Tehran's calendar or to, and on uh, Tehran's political calculus. I know, but I mean, anyone can strike anyone at any point, right? It's up to the individual actors if they want to strike. There's no reason for Iran to strike Israel unprovoked if Israel doesn't perhaps retaliate now. And after all, it was pretty much a win in the sense that there were no casualties. One little girl, obviously very badly injured, but no casualties. Well, certainly, but Israel has no intention of abandoning its shadow war against Iran. Israel's preference is to get the war back into the shadows, get back to covert escalation. That's where Israel is the most comfortable. That's where it believes it's starting to have some sort of uh, impact on Iranian policies. You know, for example, by changing the way that Iran deploys some of its frontline officers from that strike on the consulate in Damascus. So that's where Israel wants to get. But they can't get back to that place if they believe that every time they carry out covert action against the Iranians, it results in a barrage of attacks against Israel itself. And then they're not always sure that all of their allies, like Jordan and the United States, will necessarily be there for every one of these escalations, and that at some point Israel could be left on their own. It's the first time in a while, though, that Israel has felt cooperation from an international community. Israel must be pretty pleased about that and feel a little bit safer as well because of that. So in your estimation, what is the correct amount of retaliation? So the Israelis have a series of, of options they've got. Of course, they can go into the proxy theaters, third-party countries like Syria, Lebanon, where they're currently already active. They could up the ante there attack more Iranian assets in those countries. They could even strike some of the Iranian embassies in those countries again, if that's what they decided to retaliate against. Uh, but that may not be enough, because this attack came directly from Iran itself. And perhaps one of the least escalatory and yet still strategically important or strategically significant attacks could be on the origin points of some of these launch sites within Iran itself, where the attacks themselves may not cause a whole lot of damage, may not cause a lot of outrage within Iran, uh, but would still allow Israel to demonstrate that they would respond directly uh, against origin points of attack from Iranian soil. Has Israel the military manpower and the stamina, frankly, after six months of war, to do all of what you just said, as well as continue its operation in Gaza, which apparently involves another 
uh, attack on Rafah? Well, certainly no. The Israelis do not have the ability to carry out an extended campaign against Iran, which is why they need to calculate that whatever their counterattack is going to be is also a one-and-done situation. If Iran decides to re uh, reply with further attacks on Israel and we start to see the Iran-Israel relationship sort of move into something analogous to what we see in Yemen between the U.S. and the, the Houthis, where it's more or less open-ended of firing back and forth intermittently, that's something that Israel can't really afford to do and that it'll lose international support rather quickly if that's a scenario that we end up in. All right, Ryan, thank you. We have to leave it there. We will await Israel's response. Ryan Bowl, a senior Middle East and North Africa analyst at RAIN. Airlines are weighing an ever-narrowing set of options to fly between Europe and Asia. That's after they deal with airspace shutdowns in the wake of the Iranian attack on Israel. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Danny Lee, who's been keeping track. So, Danny, several airspaces closed in the early hours of Sunday morning. Some of them did reopen, including Israel's at 7.30 local time on Sunday morning. What airspaces are open and closed right now? Can you give us an update? Yeah, I think... Basically, based on what had happened uh, over the weekend, everything's pretty much got back to a level of normality, uh, particularly uh, around the airspaces of, of uh, Iran and Iraq, which are critical uh, kind of air highways between Europe, the Middle East, and and the kind of southern Asia in, in, in particular. So, you know, as you said uh, at, at the bottom of the hour, I think it's I I important to see that the markets expect a de-escalation, and that would be welcome news to the airline industry, and because these, uh, these particularly these these air highways are critical. Uh, airlines are still factoring in. There is potentially risk out there. So we've seen a number of airlines who have made alternative plans uh, to avoid overflying, for example, Iran or Iraq, uh, and will be factoring in uh, diverting flights or going around. So there'll be longer journeys, etc. So uh, I, I think for airlines, they're still going to be cautious to see how this plays out. Uh, but I think uh, overall, there is a uh, a sense of normality at the moment, uh, given what we saw play out over the weekend. Danny, I mean, will there be airspaces that are just non-traversable in the near future? I mean, there are so many airlines, you know, from you know, uh, Arab airlines to Chinese airlines to European airlines that all use parts of this space, and they can't continually change their routes, right? So what would you do if you were an airline? Yeah, I, I think for the airline industry, uh, sometimes their hands might be forced. You know, you know when you when you operate a plane, when you fly over certain routes, you are given insurance coverage, and if that insurance coverage is pulled, then clearly airlines will have to think of alternatives. We have actually seen airlines uh, factor in flying uh, across Saudi Arabia uh, through Egypt as one way around, and particularly over Central Asia, so they don't have to then fly over some of these more sensitive areas uh, in particular, particularly where we did see this kind of sudden disruption, although well telegraphed. Um, so I think for the airline industry, they are uh, already uh, factoring in that. We are seeing, though, airlines returning back to these uh, highways, particularly the Middle Eastern carriers flying over uh, Iran and Iraq. But uh, clearly, airlines are well prepared for uh, you know, all kinds of airspace disruptions, particularly what we saw in the aftermath of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war crisis, which particularly blocked a huge part of the airspace for uh, a lot of major carriers. Danny, thank you so much. That is Bloomberg's Danny Lee there, keeping track of airspace, air flights, and much, much more for us. Plenty more is still ahead. Do stay with us on Bloomberg Middle East and Africa. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. Back to our top story and the unprecedented attack by Iran on Israel. Bloomberg Economics says it's more about symbolism with minimum damage. For more analysis, let's bring in Bloomberg's chief emerging markets economist, Ziad Daoud. So, Ziad, how do you interpret this week's weekend's events? Minimal damage, yes, but perhaps only because of the help of allies such as the US and Jordan. But also, okay. there's a lot of predictability in that, Bonnie. We, a lot of us went into the weekend thinking that something like this was going to happen, an attack, direct attack from Iran to Israel was about to happen, and indeed it did happen 
uh, overnight, Saturday to Sunday. And I think it was done by design. So Iran designed it in such a way that it causes maximum symbolism but minimal damage. Symbolism in the sense that it's the first time it attacks Israel from its own soil. Symbolism in the sense that it sent actually a lot of missiles and drones, 300. Um, and symbolism that in sense he has sirens and alarms um, going uh, um, around Israel. But it also, because of the heads up, because of the uh, well-telegraphed attack, it caused minimal damage and um, no casualties in Israel. It was fascinating because before even some of the missiles would have got there, the UN was told that it was a mission complete, right? So that was really interesting, I thought. What is the impact, though, on the global economy? Well, for the global economy, okay, so the last six months, the uh, war in the Middle East has been devastating on a human level, but it had limited impact on the global economy. So global growth has actually improved. Uh, global inflation and global interest rates have not been affected by the conflict, and all oil has continued to float. And if, this, if the attacks on the weekend don't lead to an escalation and a spiral of a response and a counter-response, then the impact of the global economy would be limited. But we've seen something unprecedented on the weekend, and if we end up in a spiral of of violence between the two countries, then uh, and we have um, uh, sort of a uh, disruption to flow to oil prices and oil uh, supplies, then that could have a significant impact on the global economy and may even lead to a global recession. Looking at how markets are responding to the events of the weekend, there's very limited imp there's limited impact on the movement in oil, so they think probably the status quo will be maintained. It's interesting though because if you had to game out what an Iranian attack would look like. That's where the terror is, right? You don't know what an Iranian attack on a country like Israel is going to be. But now we've seen what it's going to be. It's going to be a telegraphed attack with maybe a lot of missiles, but also a very calculated telegraphed attack. Well, in this case, that was part of the aim. And the part of the aim is, is not to cause significant damage, and that's why it was well telegraphed. But let's also remember that we had previous attacks from Iran and other parts of the region. Aramco 2019 was a clear example in which, again, we woke up and we saw half of Saudi oil supplied basically offline in an instant. That wasn't well telegraphed. Uh, that was a precise attack, and that took uh, a lot of oil supply out of the market, and we had a response in terms of oil prices. So I think there's a difference between a well telegraphed attack and a surprising one. All right, Ziad, thank you so much. Fantastic context there from Bloomberg's Chief Emerging Markets Economist, Ziad Daoud. Joining us now is Mohammed Abdel Maguid. He's Middle East and North Africa economist at BNP Paribas. If we can just stay on the attack first, Mohammed, I want to ask you what you know the immediate impact is, given that we're not really seeing any reaction in oil markets in particular for the same reasons that Zia just outlined, which is that you know really this was not an attack that saw any damage, and also we're not seeing any impact in the Strait of Hormuz or anywhere else. Yes, um, so uh, first off, um, in terms of the flow of physical oil, nothing has changed actually since the attacks that happened over the weekend. It's also important to mention that um, where oil prices trading right now, and that's quite an elevated level of oil uh, prices, we're talking about the market closing uh, above $90 uh, per barrel uh, on, uh, on Friday. And if you compare that with previous instances where we've had uh, geopolitical volatility in the Middle East. I mean, you take, for example, 1996, and we had some major upswings between Feb and April of that year. Um, oil uh, had a knee-jerk reaction to the geopolitical events in the region, about 20% uh, overnight. However, oil was trading around 40 at $45. So the base effect also matters. At the moment, from uh, $90, um, is there room for oil to rally? Yes, there is, but it probably won't be as significant uh, as oil trading much lower. Our columnist Javier Blas was talking about 99.99 oil, you know, a cent less than $100 a barrel. Is that what, you know, OPEC plus countries are looking for in the sense that, you know, they have the option to prolong those um, supply cuts into the second half of the year? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I think in, in any case, we're probably heading towards a stronger uh, oil performance in the second half of the year for a number of reasons. Um, yes, there is the geopolitical risk premium that could develop once again into oil prices. Uh, but you also have oil um, uh, meeting a, a weaker dollar, a structurally weaker dollar, and the prospect of uh, developed market central banks also 
embarking on the cutting cycle. So that is going to support oil demand in the second half of the year. You've also got the global refinery runs peaking in September. So I think there's a number of factors that would support stronger oil in the second half of the year. Whether we go to 90 or not, um, I, I don't have a strong conviction there. But, you know, I think in, in, in the mid to, a, uh, mid to high 80s, I think that's a fair assumption. Is there a gap between market sentiment and geopolitical risk right now? It does feel like, you know, the geopolitical risk premium is slowly coming out of this market. Look, um, yesterday the uh, Saudi Tadawul opened um, uh, and closed actually 1% lower than uh, or less than 1%, actually 0.3% uh, compared to the uh, level it closed at before Eid. Um, so there is a very clear signal, in my opinion, that the market is uh, of the mood, you know, stay calm and keep trading. Um, the extent of selling also across the index was much less broad based than it was on the uh, first day of trading after the 7th of October attacks. So um, and that in itself is indicative that the market doesn't necessarily see a systemic uh, geopolitical risk event taking place. So um, I think there is a gap indeed between um, where the events are in the Middle East and where the market is, um, is headed. Mohammed, before you go, I do want to ask you a little bit about your most recent work, which is on Egypt, and obviously other events have sort of taken precedence in the last few days and weeks. But before that, Egypt got this massive bailout, and it looked, things were looking up for Egypt. How do you see that economy faring over the next six to 12 months? Look, I mean, e Egypt fundamentally has uh, two problems or had two problems going into the IMF bailout and the uh, funds that came from the UAE. It had a liquidity problem and it had a structural problem. I, I think the liquidity part has been addressed more or less uh, or at, at the very least contained. Uh, the structural problems remain. So if you're asking me about the time horizon, I think that's a very important question. If you're talking about the next six to 12 months, liquidity problems are contained. I think the mar market will continue to remain supported by the IMF bailout, by the UAE funds that will continue to flow, uh, including another tranche in uh, early May, hopefully. Um, beyond that, I think we need to see a clear signal from the government that it is serious this time about uh, structural reforms, especially with regards to improving the uh, level of public investments, participation from private sector, as well as the export potential for the country. All right, we have to leave it there. But, Mohammed, thank you so much for your time today. That's Mohammed Abdel Magoud. He's Middle East and North Africa senior economist at BNP Paribas. Plenty more still ahead. Do stay with us on Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. It's another big week for U.S. bank earnings with Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, all due to report, among others. And that's after net interest income missed analyst estimates for peers, including J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, although Citi's profit topped expectations. And that was all on Friday, would you believe? Let's bring in Bloomberg reporter Charlie Wells. Charlie, it seems like forever ago with everything that's happened in between, but markets, particularly in the U.S., are certainly going to be focused on things like Goldman Sachs earnings after J.P. Morgan. What was it down? six and a half percent in the Friday session. What details are emerging about Wall Street Bank performance? Yeah, well, look, there is a sense of normalization in a lot of these big earnings, and we really are sort of in the eye of earnings season for the bank so far. And the theme that really stuck out from some of these majors on Friday was just that sort of pressure of net interest income. And that has been such a boon for some of these banks, but it seems like it's coming under pressure. We had that miss on net interest income from J.P. Morgan, a miss at Wells Fargo. And of course, as you mentioned, Citigroup did manage to meet expectations. But really, you know, this is the major way that these large banks bring in revenue. And so the pressure that they're under on this uh, metric really is important. And it's one that D uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, spoke about. He talked about normalization of the pressure that they're facing as they need to pay out more to depositors um, over time. 
Goldman Sachs, in a few hours, what should we expect from David Solomon et al.? Yeah, so difficult 2023. We remember that was one of executions Solomon talked about. But look, there is hope that the increased capital market activity that we've seen over the past few months could benefit this bank. And expectations are relatively high here in some of these fees. So for equity underwriting, the expectation in that first quarter is growth of 20 percent. For debt underwriting, or, excuse me, 30 percent. For debt underwriting, the expectation is a growth of about 20 percent. So a lot of focus there. Let's see if they can meet. It. Charlie, thank you. You have to leave it there, but looking forward to seeing what happens. We get later on today Goldman Sachs, Schwab, and MT Bank among the banks reporting today. That's Bloomberg's Charlie Wells there in London for us. I do want to take you out with some markets checks, though, because we are still monitoring the impact of late Saturday night, Sunday morning's attack by Iran on Israel. And so far, and this is also including everything that's going on at the Federal Reserve and with earnings season starting up and so on, we are seeing futures higher after a very down day on Friday. S&P futures, Nasdaq futures, Dow futures and Eurostoxx 50 futures higher. Let's move to Treasuries because we might see more of a geopolitical reaction there. So far, not so much. We're not seeing a huge amount of reaction. A couple of basis points higher on the two-year, a couple of basis points higher on the five and ten-year as well, and the 30-year. We'll see, though, later on in the day what other reaction we get out of Israel. We are still waiting on some kind of an official response from Israel. Do stay with us here on Bloomberg. There is a lot more to be parsed through. You've been watching Bloomberg Middle East and Africa. Into Europe next with Tom McKenzie.